from all across the grand majestic reaches of the Union. Welcome to Boston's Bunker Hill Day, June 17th, 2013, when we commemorate all those that fought on Bunker Hill, and we will start as they did on that day with a prayer. Lord, will you please bless this country and help us turn back to you, O oh Lord. Help us turn back to you. I stood with the Patriot Pastor, whom I'm about to introduce, in Lexington on the 19th of April, Lord, our nation's true birthday this year. And you showed us on that day two possibilities, one of a great awakening to your truth and your power and your way, and the other way is a, is a rude awakening. And we feel your hand of providence and protection being lifted from this country. And our first responsibility is to turn back to you, O oh Lord, just as they did on the 17th of June, 1775. And without further ado, may I please introduce my good friend, the Patriot Pastor, Garrett Lear. King, but King Jesus. Blah. In honor of the reading of God's word, if you'll stand, and I particularly put this biblical challenge out here today in front of the people that are in the building behind us and all around this area that's called Government Center. And the charge that I give them, as if it were an election day sermon, by the way, it's always election day. By reminding our elected representatives, they are not our masters, they are our servants. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, at verse 2, reading from the translation of scripture that our founding fathers used, King James and also the Geneva Bible, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me, he who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, like the tender grass springing out of the earth by shining, clear shining after the rain. That's the promise of Almighty God to us if we obey his ways. And that is the way that jurisprudence and government was started here in America. Well, I've brought a few of my favorite flags with me. For example, one of the first and most important colonial flags, an appeal to heaven. That's what we're doing. Liberty Tree, an appeal to God. So much for the revisionist historians that say that America was not founded on Bible and Christ. They're wrong, and we are very much right, and we can prove it. I've also brought one of my other favorite flags, one of our first colonial flags, and used as one of our first naval flags, don't tread on me. And why, of course, was it a snake, a rattlesnake? not because of looking at the snake of a representative of some evil device, but looking at their rattlesnake as never giving anyone any trouble. First, they give a warning by rattling their tail. Then after that, if you decide to mess with them and step on them, then they bite. And one of my other favorite flags, land of the free and home of the brave. And I exhort and encourage all of you in typical black robe regiment fashion, in other words, the preachers of the War for American Independence. And I can assure you that on Bunker Hill Day, nobody went into battle before the many chaplains had prayed and exhorted them from scripture that America will remain the home of the free and the land of the brave as long as America remains brave and as long as there are people who will stand for freedom, like many of you that have gathered here today. The Massachusetts Provisional Committee of Safety passed a resolution June 15, 1775, for possession of the hill called Bunker's Hill in Charlestown to be securely kept and defended. And with this decision, the Battle of Bunker Hill, 
and the first combat of the, of the latter to be known as the Continental Army would be precipitated. And although the tyrannical British establishment called us rebels, we were not that at all. We true American patriots, like those here today, nobly dared to challenge the authority of an out-of-order government that was in violation of all decency, and we defended our native rights. In 1774, the Provincial Congress in Massachusetts Bay issued a resolution, and that resolution was resistance to tyranny becomes the Christian and social duty of each individual. So in a sense, we might say that the Battle of Bunker, Bunkers Hill, Bunker Hill, Reed Hill, all are intertwined there, I'll explain that a little bit in a few moments, might be considered righteously rebellious, that would be better said, as necessary and lawful resistance being under orders by our duly elected American government to engage heroically a superior and seemingly invincible power. In the story of America's Great Seal, a particularly relevant chapter is the imagery suggested by Benjamin Franklin in August of 1776. He chose the dramatic historical scene described in the book of Exodus in the Bible where people confronted a tyrant in order to gain their freedom. Thomas Jefferson liked that motto, rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. In fact, so much, he used it on his personal seal. Also, it seems to have inspired the upper motto on the final reverse side of the great seal, Anuit Coeptis, which means God has favored our undertakings. And I can certainly say that happened at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Everett, Edward Everett Hale, a person who certainly had many patriotic American ancestors like Nathaniel Hale and Edward Everett, of which there are cities named after these people and so forth, said this, and I encourage each and every one of you as patriots today to not always be looking for a mass movement, and Bunker Hill was not a mass movement. I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything but I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. What I can do, I should do. And what I should do, by the grace of Almighty God, I will do. And though some people think for America, as they might have thought in that day, June 17th, 1775 Bunker Hill Day that we commemorate here today, it is never, ever too late to do the right thing. Their cause there at Bunker Hill was really a profoundly conservative cause. Most of them really sought a return to the Crown's salutary neglect of colonists prior to the 1760s. Britain began imposing taxes and in responding to American resistance with coercion and troops. They wanted the liberties of British subjects, not necessarily, at that time, American independence. Well, that began to change once they drew innocent blood at Lexington and Concord, which is why the Bunker Hill battle is very pivotal. The chaotic skirmishing at Lexington and Concord in April 1775 left the British holed up in Boston and hostile colonists occupying the city's surrounds, but it remained unclear whether the ill-equipped patriots were willing or able to engage the British Army in a pitched battle. Leaders on both sides also thought the conflict might yet be settled without a full-scale war. Who wants to go to war? Who wants to lose blood and treasure? And this intense two-month stalemate broke in the night of June 16th in a confused manner that marks much of the revolution, what I like to call the War for American Independence, uh, start. Over a thousand colonists marched east from Cambridge with orders to fortify Bunker Hill, which is a 110-foot rise on the Charleston 
uh, Peninsula, Charlestown Peninsula, jutting into Boston Harbor. But the Americans bypassed Bunker Hill in the dark and instead began fortifying Breeds Hill, a smaller rise, much closer to Boston and almost in the face of the British. Now, why would they do that? It put them closer to the British. It put them in greater harm's way than if they'd been on Bunker Hill. They actually, in a sense, though they knew that they were not the superior force of the British, were willing to stand their ground. This is the American bravura. This is the American original intent. This is what is in the DNA of Americans all over this country. And it was so then, and it still is now. The reasons for this moon maneuver, you might say, are sort of murky, but it was a purposeful act, a provocation, and not the smartest move militarily. We made many moves that were not the smartest militarily. We did it out of courage and conviction for liberty and freedom. They were very short on cannon. They were short on the know-how to even fire what few cannons they had, and I believe they had six very small ones. One later got the Hancock cannon after John Hancock. The Patriots couldn't do much damage from Breed's Hill, but their threatening position on high ground just across the water from Boston forced the British to try to dislodge the Americans before they were reinforced or fully entrenched. So on that morning, a glorious morning for America on June 17th, as the Patriots frantically threw up what was called breastworks of earth, fence posts and stone, the British bombarded the hill. One cannonball actually decapitated one of the men, and as he and his comrades worked on, even though one of their comrades died, he said, we've been fatigued by our labor, having no sleep the night before, very little to eat, no drink but rum. A private wrote, the danger we were in made us think there was treachery and that we were brought there to be all slain. Sometimes we think, looking back on that history, that they just wanted to be in the history books, or that it was such a glorious day for America that it wasn't fraught with destruction, blood, guts, and all the things that would scare most people off if they were not patriots with great conviction under the grace of Almighty God. Hero of the revolutionary Boston era, Dr. Joseph Warren, which incidentally, as I was walking across the square, a man walked up to me and he said, Dr. Warren, I said, I'd be glad to be known as Dr. Warren, who later became the president of the Massachusetts Provisional Congress. He was the physician that led the Patriot Underground and became Major General of the Colonial Army in a lead up to Bunker Hill, which went from the Massachusetts Provisional Army to the Continental Army right after the Bunker Hill battle. He refused to assume command, fighting as an ordinary soldier and dying from a bullet in the face during the final assault because they were not looking for personal preeminence. They were standing their grounds as righteous patriots in the cause of freedom. Warren's body was stripped, thrown in a mass grave, and later he was only identified because of the false teeth that Paul Revere had actually made for him. They were exhausted, they were exposed. The American collection of militia from different colonies with little coordination and no clear chain of command by contrast, and listen carefully because this is quite humorous. The British, of course, uh, who at midday began disembarking from boats near the American position, were among the best trained troops in all of Europe. And they were led by seasoned commanders, one of whom was General Howe, who marched confidently at the head of his men, accompanied by a servant. They didn't take us very seriously. And he actually marched in front of his troops coming up Reed's Hill, and he had a servant carrying a bottle of wine for him. That's what he thought about us. Well, the British also torched Charlestown. For those of you that might think that the British cause was very peaceful, they torched Charlestown at the base of Reed's Hill, turning church steeples into great pyramids of fire and adding ferocious heat to what was already a warm June afternoon. All this was clearly visible to the many spectators crowded on hills, rooftops, and steeples in and around Boston. Think about that today. Watching the battle as if they were watching the Boston Red Sox play baseball. Included in that group was Abigail Adams and her young son, John Quincy Adams, who later became our sixth president. And I can tell you they were greatly impacted. Another observer was British General John Burgoyne, who watched from Copps Hill and now ensued 
he said, one of the greatest scenes of war that can be conceived. He wrote that the blazing town, the roaring cannons, and the sight of red-coated troops <coughs> ascending Breed's Hill. However, the seemingly open pasture proved not to be so easy for those British redcoats coming up. And basically, to move us on quickly, I want to say that um, there was a, a statement made, and it may or may not have been true, by Colonel Isaac Putnam, who said, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. That probably may not be exactly true, but they did say, don't fire until they're at least uh, within 50 yards or less because of the kind of weaponry they used. When the wave of British advanced towards them in order to swallow them up, a private Peter Brown said, but they found a choky mouthful of us. And I hope that we still can find a choky mouthful of us in America today. Because when those patriots opened fire, the close packed British fell in clumps. In some spots, the British lines became jumbled. And basically what happened here is British were just piled upon British. They found out that we were not the ragtag group of rebels that they thought that we were people fighting for our homeland, just like people that are here today feel the same way. And basically, before that day was over, they were dead four to one, two hours. And that was pretty amazing. People came in like John, um, from John Stark from the 1st Militia Brigade from New Hampshire and the 3rd Brigade from New Hampshire. They showed up just in time to relieve Colonel Prescott. Colonel Prescott had determined that his people needed to leave and General John Stark, who is a courageous man for certain, uh, guarded them in their departure. We'll call it that. They weren't fleeing and they certainly weren't uh, deserting, but they realized they had done what they could do for the day. It's very interesting um, that the disciplined British quickly reformed their ranks and advanced again with the same result. One British officer was moved to quote Falstaff from Shakespeare, they make us here but food for gunpowder. You see, that's what happens when God is on your side. That's what happens when you raise the flag to Almighty God and, and you put your cause before the Lord as an appeal to heaven. And of course, it wasn't, the day was historically known as the British had conquered in the day, but it was really a very big victory. It wasn't a great victory. They lost many of their officers. In fact, they lost quite a number of their officers to the point where that greatly hurt them because our people started shooting the officers. So it really was no victory for them. But it also proved something we proved on Lexington Green, and something we proved at Concord Bridge, and something we proved at Trenton, and something we proved all over, that we could defeat a superior force, not because we had better weaponry, not because we had better training, although we were well trained, but because we had the American heart, the American spirit, the American original intent to defend our homeland. We did not aggress against them. We defended, and by the way, Major Pitcairn died that day as well as Joseph Warren did, and Major Pitcairn was no friend of ours in Lexington and Concord. Isn't it interesting how things work out? And so, as I bring this to a close, I want to remind you of those very things at Bunker Hill Day, which we still celebrate, and as long as it's on my watch in my life, we will always celebrate it, is a reminder that simple people, yes, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, can actually fight. When they ran out of bullets, when they ran out of powder, they actually used their muskets, they used their hands, they actually threw rocks at the British. Can you imagine being a British red coat and having been hit between the eyes with, with a colonial rock? And yes, you know here in New England we grow rocks. And yes, we do learn how to throw them. And so what we want to take away from here today, and I remind also the Massachusetts state motto, which shows that we have never been an aggressive people. We've always been defending against tyranny, just like today. It's sort of deja vu all over again, isn't it? And that motto, Ense Petet Placidam Subliberat Quietem. Everyone speak Latin here? Well, I can tell you, Bunker Hill Day, 
1775, they did understand some of these things. And here's the English translation. By the sword, we seek peace, but peace only under liberty. And so that was actually adopted as a motto. And so we remember the names of Isaac Putnam, Richard Gridley, William Prescott, Joseph Warren, John, John Stark, and many, many others, but particularly the people like Private Brown and all the other privates that we don't know their names. Many of them were buried in, in graves that we have not found and so forth and so on. But people just like us, the salt and the light of this country, of which there's still more. And of course, in the light of that role of what happened later, a bookseller from this city, motivated by what happened there, went in winter to Fort Ticonderoga. His name was Henry Knox. He spent a lot of time reading the books he was selling. And he did a military campaign that in all the history of the world was excellent, but he brought enough cannons from Fort Ticonderoga, captured from the British, to Dorchester Heights. And the British said, you know what? We're leaving town. And they went up to Nova Scotia. You see, that's what happened when people stand their ground and they stand up. One man standing up stiffens other men's spines. That's what happened. And into the book of Joshua, first chapter, four times says, be of good courage. America, I say this to you. Boston, cradle of liberty, I say it to you today. Be of good courage. We're still needed today, as those American patriots were. We today, American patriot Christians, are still needed. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land of my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. And that fourth verse, even more important in my mind, our fathers God to thee, Author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright, with be freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God our King. And I want to tell you that Samuel Adams, the last of the great Puritans, the father of the American War for Independence, said, if ever should come a time when vain and aspiring men shall possess the highest seats in government, our country will stand in need of its experienced patriots to prevent its ruin. And that time has come once again. And I pray the prayer of Jonas Clark. May that God, who is the God of righteousness and salvation, still appear for us, go forth with our armies, tread down our enemies, and cleanse and avenge our innocent blood. And may we be prepared by a general repentance and thorough reformation for his gracious and powerful interposition in our behalf. And then may we see the displays of his power and glory for our salvation, which God of his infinite mercy grant for his mercy's sake in Christ Jesus. Someone has stolen my country, and I want her back, and I want her back now. is the Patriot Pastor. He called for, and I call for all the pastors across this great land of ours to join in in calling for a fifth great awakening to the power, truth, and love of Jesus Christ. And to see how that is done, won't you please go to Water From The Well at YouTube, The Patriot Pastor Speaks in Lexington, Massachusetts on April 19th, 2013, Anno Domini, Year of Our Lord. We need that great awakening. He is preaching for that great awakening. I am doing what I can as a lay Christian to promote that. Without that protective healing spirit of God, uh, we're not going to make it. And won't you also, if you like this speech and you want to hear more sermons, won't you please give out your website's pastor? Thepatriotpastor.org. Thepatriotpastor.org. Thank you. Thank you, Tricorner Tom. So, one of the things they were fighting for and was mentioned in the Declaration of Independence was this land. And we 
know of our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. John Locke talked about life, liberty, and property. And one of the great rights that we have in this country is the right to own your own business and the right to own your own property and the right to decide what you're going to do with that property without others interfering with it, without the government coming in and saying you have to do this and that and that inside your own home. And that is what is going on today in a lot of towns across Massachusetts and across New England with Agenda 21, which is a United Nations plan, and also ICLEI, the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives. My good friend and compatriot Hal Shirtliff and I on Flag Day, which was Friday, uh, Dedham, Massachusetts has one of the largest Flag Day uh, parades, and we uh, had a float to get Iclia out of the town of Dedham. And Iclia has been kicked out of the town of Carver in Massachusetts, which is uh, your ancestral hometown, so we can do this and we can get back to you know, private property rights. And here to speak more on that, because most people probably don't know how their rights are being attacked by ICLEA Agenda 21, is uh, compatriot Claire Donegan, halt massachusettssmartmeters.org. Claire, won't you please tell us the threats that this poses to our liberties? Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Um, pleased to be here. And my takeaway from the Patriot Pastor's uh, talk was we are still brave Americans and we still need to stand up and fight against tyranny. Um, the people of the days of yore are not very different from us. We just need to get on board and figure out what is going on. Uh, and one of the problems that we're facing immediately is the uh, installation of, quote, smart meters uh, in Massachusetts and globally. It is a paradigm shift that is being forced on us in a very stealth manner, and unless we rise up en masse and halt the billion dollar expenditure before uh, we halt that expenditure, before the meters are installed, we'll be, there'll be no going back. What these meters do is not only do they collect granular data of our daily home lives, what we're doing, when we're doing it, and with what we are using, what we're using to do that, these meters also um, get instructions from the powers that be as to what can go on in our home. And they reveal uh, very, great, very uh, minute details of our home lives um, and what's been heretofore our, our private home. And um, what is their agenda? What is their agenda today? What is their agenda next year? And what is their agenda going to be in 10 years? That's a shifting agenda. And then somebody somewhere with their finger on that button, and that agenda we have no control over. Um, it is an abysmal, slippery slope the, uh, that doesn't even exist yet. The, these smart meters are actually building that slope, and we have got to stop it. Um, and the privacy issue is not even, in many eyes, the worst uh, issue. The group I'm in, called masmartmeters.org, is not a necessarily conservative organization. We are liberals and conservatives together. These meters do not care who you vote for, and they marginalize an entire subset of our population who are sensitive to the microwave emissions that they emit. Um, there is also a terrorist issue with the security of these. That MIT said the more smart meters are added to the smart grid, uh, the higher the uh, incidence of cyber attacks. They've caused fires across the country and across the globe. And the sheer volume and scope of the issues with these is an indicator of the money and power behind them. We must stand up, we must stop, we must educate ourselves, and we have to do it together. Thank you. further on how our property rights are being attacked is my good friend David Kopass. Uh, David is a 10-year veteran of um, the Municipal Conservation Association out in Western Massachusetts. He is also the president of the Massachusetts Assembly 
Republican Assembly, uh, which takes the, 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 the saying, uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness very seriously. And he's also a fearless crusader against Agenda 21 and ICLEI, which is taking over all of our towns right now. So here to tell you to expand on, on what Claire said and to, uh, to tell you what you can do to fight this is my good friend David Kopass. David. Well, thank you everybody for uh, coming out today. Uh, it was a beautiful day to be celebrating Bunker Hill Day. And uh, in line with the, the property rights struggle that took place back at that time, uh, we're faced with a modern day um, suppression of our property rights. And what exactly does that mean to have property rights here in America is a dialogue that's long lost and we have to bring that back. I've spent uh, 10 years serving in municipal conservation and uh, working with municipal government. And I hold a degree in the environmental sciences, so I, I have been exposed to a lot of land use policy and regulation in that respect. And in the 10 years that I've been in that capacity, I've seen the oppression and the extinguishment of property rights by the individual happen on a regular basis. And I was appalled. I was frightened for my child's future, for, for our own future, those of us that are here today. Our property rights are in danger. One of the things that I noticed as I open up public dialogues with your average individuals is that property rights are something that is apolitical. Everybody would like to have the, the liberty to manage and control their own property, to do what's best to, to accrue the wealth. And what is sorely missing here in America is we've lost that connection between the individual's right to own property and the ability to create wealth. All wealth comes from that right to create property, which is why in socialist nations, we see the average income uh, annually of several thousand dollars because it's government that retains that right of property ownership and the ability to create wealth. So, not liking the bureaucratic procedures that I saw, I set out to find people that were interested in pursuing property rights issues. And what I found is the individuals themselves were more than happy to evaluate these policies and protect these rights. So to that end, I, I got together with some colleagues to form a group here in Massachusetts called the Massachusetts Property Rights Council. And what I'd like to do is read the mission statement of this particular group. It is a nonpartisan group. Uh, as the speaker before me mentioned, these issues are not Democrat and Republican. They apply to everybody. So if you would indulge me, I would like to read the mission statement of the Massachusetts Property Rights Council. The Massachusetts Property Rights Council is a statewide grassroots coalition of property rights advocates that seeks to review, comment, and distribute critical information that is potentially a uh, negative impact to individual property rights of citizens of the Commonwealth. MassPRC recognizes that the relationship associated with individual rights of private citizens to own property is unique to Americans and directly connected to wealth creation in our pursuit of happiness. Therefore, we seek to help private citizens thoroughly understand the profound importance of their various property rights as compared to proposed environmental and land use plans and potentially threaten the same. Our goal is to educate the public on property rights uniquely characteristic to Americans and how that critical relationship empowers us to combine individual liberty with the checks and balances of free market forces to simultaneously sustain economic growth, protect natural environments, and increase our quality of life. Mass PRC's focus and related services shall include, but are not limited to, the following. Public education on matters of private, real, and intellectual property issues. Providing informational public forums and separate of stakeholder facilitated consensus meetings, visioning sessions, soirettes, and other modes of manufactured consent. Identifying all proposed federal, international policies that threaten state sovereignty, local municipal control, and individual property rights. 
identifying and isolating specific components of comprehensive plans formulated by stakeholder groups and public-private partnerships that fail to recognize private land stewardship as an indispensable part of American heritage, sustainability, and strength. Providing a source to draft bylaws to seek and protect, strengthen, and individual property rights in local planning efforts, and providing timely activity reports on councils of government, regional planning commissions, land trust, non-governmental organizations, and all other unelected bureaucratic entities in order to enhance awareness of pending policies that could impact individual property rights. To serve as a resource to municipal and city governments that wish to retain local control in critical planning efforts while protecting individual property rights of their constituents. To demand verifiable documentation and material support for all claims, survey results, map overlays, statistical expressions or statements made by stakeholders, planners, NGOs, or any federal, state, or international entities proposing environmental and land use policies for regulatory consideration. And finally, to research and develop a wide range of private stewardship options to address environmental concerns and promote the sustainable long-term management of land in a manner that benefits the owner, the community, and the Commonwealth. MassPRC's commitment to restoring and securing individual property rights is driven by our confidence in the free market and the citizens' inherent motivation to protect and grow the value of their own property. To that end, MassPRC shall strive to aid citizens in defending and, this, and securing these rights in perpetuity while actively working with municipalities to develop local solutions to validated problems using a combined power of individual property rights and free market uh, forces to achieve our goals. Property rights are individual rights, like all of our rights in this country. They cannot be viewed as collective. When we begin to accept terms and rights as being uh, divvied out and, and done in the benefit of the collective, we are talking socialism. This 